Donc, bonjour tout le monde. Ça me fait plaisir de, de vous présenter André-Marie Tremblay, et, et collègue ici au, au département de physique. André-Marie a travaillé dans le sujet des superconducteurs à haute température depuis plus de 30 ans. Il a fait des contributions très importantes. Et, et récemment, il a aussi, avec une collaboration avec d'autres chercheurs, trouvé des, des clés pour les mécanismes de possible mécanisme pour augmenter la température critique dans les supraconducteurs à, à haute TC. OK, so, uh, we start again. Okay, why, why, why be interested in superconductivity? Well, uh, there are clearly uh, applications. For example, uh, you can uh, uh, transport electricity without resistance, so uh, perhaps uh, take uh, solar energy uh, to uh, regions that are less fortunate with uh, with sun or you can build uh, magnets uh, that are used for example in uh, in the nuclear magnetic resonance or levitation for fast magnetic trains like this one in shanghai or the devices that are the basis of quantum uh, computers and there are several other applications here that i don't uh, mention so it's interesting to ask the question could we have uh, superconductivity at room temperature if we could that would make a big uh, difference uh, in the technology. So what is the state of the art? Here I plot the superconducting transition temperature for various compounds here in color and uh, as a function of the year of, the, of discovery. And uh, the different colors uh, represent different families of, uh, of compounds. And then there's a break in the scale here. And we almost have room temperature superconductivity you see in this compound. The problem is that this pressure uh, corresponds to the pressure at the center of the earth. So it's not so, so convenient. So I will focus on this family here of uh, so-called cuprate uh, superconductors uh, that were the first one to whose transition temperature surpassed the uh, temperature of liquid nitrogen, which is rather cheap. Uh, the, their atomic structure looks uh, quite complicated, but you will see that uh, uh, quantum mechanics uh, helps us, us a lot. In fact, all the action occurs in these copper oxygen planes. So, so copper is, here is in black and oxygens are, are in red. So uh, who ordered uh, this? Uh, it turns out that the phase diagram in the end is quite complicated. Forgot to see here that the role of these uh, other segments of the, of the atomic structure, uh, we will look at it in more details, but at this point, we see it just as a way of adding or removing uh, electrons in the, 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 the conduction planes. So uh, here it was, it, we will talk at, about hole doping. So we remove electrons from this, uh, this plane. So the phase diagram has to be done as a function of temperature and uh, hole doping. And here, uh, zero doping here means one electron, one conduction electron on average per unit cell. And the state here is antiferromagnetic. And then there's a, it, a MUT insulator. I will explain what the MUT insulator is. Then there's a pseudo gap, strange metal, quantum critical point, competing ground state. It's, it's quite complicated, in fact. And I talked about many of these other phases during the first talk in the first uh, session. The, fir the first term. But now I will focus just on superconductivity in the presence of strong uh, electronic uh, repulsion. So I will focus on this superconducting, so called superconducting dome. Uh, it's uh, interesting to have superconductivity at high temperature for applications, but it's also an extremely fascinating uh, and highly quantum mechanical problem. And so there's a fundamental interest in this. So we will just uh, as a first shot, we will represent these uh, copper oxygen planes as uh, with the, the Hubbard model. So in this model, you have electrons that are hopping from unit cell to unit cell with a different hopping amplitude. And when there are two electrons in the same unit cell, there's a strong screen Coulomb interaction. That's called the U in this case. So in terms of uh, uh, Hamiltonian, there's a 
term that is a kinetic energy, basically, which is just a hopping of electrons between the sites. And there is a strong uh, repulsion when two electrons are in the same uh, unit cell. So why, why is this a highly quantum mechanical problem? Because these two terms are of comparable size. So if I add just this kinetic energy term, then it would be diagonalized by plane waves, right? I just block states. If I add just uh, this term, uh, the Coulomb uh, repulsion, then it would be diagonalized by putting electron in unit cells in such a way that they don't step on each other. So in other words, this term in the Hamiltonian is diagonalized by plane waves and this one by putting particles or electrons on unit, each unit cell. So in some sense, this is the embodiment of particle whole, uh, particle wave duality in quantum mechanics. There's no good basis. I mean, it, the, the, the plane wave basis is not that good and the localized basis is actually a little bit better, but not, not uh, that good uh, either. So you see that the solution of this problem, this wave function will be quite complicated. It will be highly entangled if you want. It will have both plane wave and uh, conduction electron behavior. Uh, the other thing that makes it highly quantum mechanical is that it's a spin, uh, spin one half. Now, uh, okay, now I have sound, it seems. <laughs> so uh, I need to introduce one more concept that will be useful for us uh, uh, later. And I ask you to memorize this formula here, J is 40 square over U. We will use it. So suppose this interaction is very strong. Then the solution we saw is to have one electron in each unit cell. Now, if I turn on the hopping, then it, the, if the spins are parallel, nothing can happen because of the Pauli principle. I cannot have two up spins on the same unit cell. But if the spins are anti-parallel, then I can lower the energy by allowing the wave function to contain some double occupancy terms. In second order, the generic perturbation theory, it means that you go, uh, you occupy this virtual state and go back to this. And that gives you the lowering of the energy for anti-parallel spins with an energy unit that's 40 square uh, over U. So the full bandwidth here is of order eight times the hopping amplitude. And that has to be compared with U. And for these problems, these two energy scales are comparable. So the outline of the talk is that I will briefly describe the method that is used. Uh, then I will show you D-wave superconductivity in the one band Hubbard model. I think many of you have heard this before. I apologize for this. And uh, I will talk about the three band uh, Hubbard model that will be sort of the, the punchline in some sense. So I will show how you how oxygen can probe the details of what's happening. And I will explain three experiments or show that calculations can understand three experiments that show how to optimize the wave superconductivity. The take home messages will be that uh, a detailed picture of the origin of superconductivity in cuprates follows from a model that takes into account copper, oxygen, kinetic energy, and uh, repulsion. And we need to look beyond traditional tools of solid state physics to work, work this out. So a few words about the method. The precursors is a density functional theory. So I will use later the results of density functional theory to get a handle on what are the parameters of the microscopic Hamiltonian that we use. But then given this microscopic Hamiltonian, we do need to do some many body physics. In other words, we cannot just diagonalize with plane waves or with localized particles. We need to have both aspects uh, together. So, it's, uh, so this based on dynamical mean field theory that I will explain here uh, cluster generalization uh, very briefly. So suppose I take a, a small part of this, of the infinite cluster and I put all the interactions, everything in this uh, uh, there. And then I let 
the, I represent the surroundings of this uh, that is in the infinite lattice by um, a dynamical mean field that if you want is a way to, and if you think in terms of the Feynman picture of uh, quantum mechanics is a retarded interaction, a retarded hopping, I'm sorry, where electrons can leave the cluster here and come back uh, anywhere else at any later time. And you have to sum over all these possibilities. That's what quantum mechanics uh, tells you. So uh, this uh, set of uh, processes are represented by a so-called hybridization function that fits into this, uh, this object here. So given this hybridization function and everything else, I can compute the effect of interactions and this gives me a scattering rate or a self energy, if you want, that represents the effect of interactions on this cluster. And solving this cluster problem is the difficult part of the problem, actually. Now, what you want is to make, that's the conceptual basis of this, is to make the localized and delocalized aspect consistent. So the way you do this is that you copy the self energy everywhere on this infinite lattice. And then that you ask that projecting back uh, the, the propagation amplitude or the Green's function uh, from the infinite lattice to the localized lattice gives you the same answer. So you need to adjust this hybridization function until you this self-consistency is achieved. So that's the idea. Do you have any questions on, on this? So the difficult part, as I said, is to solve this. So in the, the, in the, the jargon of the field, it's, you need a an uh, impurity solver that I mentioned in a moment. There are also uh, momentum space versions of this approach that I don't have time to discuss, but I will show a few results. So impurity solvers. One of them is just to do exact diagonalization. So you, you take a, a cluster and you add uh, some extra site uh, outside that, are, uh, that will have an amortization function that will be determined self-consistently. And this is the, the, the code that uh, David Seneschal developed and that we use a lot in what I will present the next. To do things at finite temperature, you need to do, use so-called continuous time quantum Monte Carlo that sums the set of all Feynman diagrams to infinite order in a power series in the hybridization function that appears uh, here. So we, uh, we have contributed to the, the methodology of this. And so we have our own codes, but they, they are used now also in a lot of uh, uh, freely available codes. <clears throat> so there are many groups uh, using these methods and I won't have time to give credit to everyone in this short uh, presentation, but I want you to keep in mind that it's used uh, basically um, everywhere uh, in China also, I should add now. Uh, how can we criticize these methods? There are positive and negative aspects. So a positive aspect is that long range order is not obtained by a mean field factorization on the cluster. You allow symmetry breaking only in the bath of non-interacting uh, electrons. So that's a plus, I would say. Included exactly are the short range dynamical and spatial correlations. And the negative aspect is that you're missing the long wavelength particle all and particle particle fluctuation. So this met, these methods are good when the corresponding correlation lengths are small. And when will that happen? It will happen at high temperature and in the broken symmetry state at low temperature. But the, the accuracy for predicting exactly TC is not that, that good. So any questions? So let me move to uh, D wave superconductivity in the one band model and just one. Uh, André Marie? Oui. Est-ce que tu m'entends, c'est William? Oui. J'ai une question uh, in English for everyone. Um, so, what do you think about uh, the proposals of certain people regarding the role of fractionalization in the phase diagram? You know, uh, for example, Sabir has some works in that direction. Um, and I know this probably is hard to include in the CDMFT, right? Or my my point of view is that uh, these ideas with uh, fractionalization and uh, 
uh, sort of mean field like theory, more mean field than what I'm presenting here, are, are useful, but it's very hard to know if you're, they are really representing the solution of the, of the Hubbard model, which I believe is the right starting point. So what I would say is try to do some numerical, that's what we're doing, try to do some numerical approach that is you believe our accurate solution of the Hubbard model, and then look at all the available mean field theories, because there are, as you know, there are many fractalization. Uh, Subir himself has a lot of methods that uh, a lot of mean field theories that he proposed. And you find the one that fits most, and then you try to say, okay, this is where the physics is, because it's hard to get the physics out of numerical results. But I will show you that we do actually here in this case. So um, uh, one thing that comes out that I mentioned last time that I won't mention now is that uh, uh, the local singlets are quite important. So this reasoning valence band ideas are, have some, some merit. And uh, some of these fractionalization ideas also come from, uh, from uh, having these, uh, these uh, singlets. And um, uh, the last thing I would add is that uh, uh, Subir has a paper where they did a detailed comparison uh, with the CDMFT results for the pseudo gap, if I remember correctly. And uh, the, there were, I mean, the lots of adjusting parameters, but uh, they seem to give some, some good results for this, uh, this one theory. But the advantage of the method that I present there, here is that it, it, it deals with antifermentism, with superconductivity, with the pseudo gap and with the strange metal all in one method. You see what I mean? I don't need to have a new method for a different phase. But you still need to choose the, um, the order parameters, right? That you're yeah, uh, that's, allowing. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's done in, uh, all the time. And uh, we know what the order parameter is, for, at least for the anti-magnet and for the D-wave. <laughs> but for the pseudo gap, uh, we, for, the, I mean, for the pseudo gap, there may not be an order parameter. So there may be just a crossover. So, uh, yeah, but uh, here I'm dealing with uh, superconductivity. Mm -hmm. And will you compare uh, the numerical results with, for example, the MRG on, uh, on ladders, or those results are not that interesting in the regime where, where will you be discussing? Because the DMRG, at least in some certain models, gives quite interesting unbiased results. Usually spin models here is fermion models, so it's a larger Hilbert space. <laughs> uh, so is that relevant for the, the regimes that you'll be working in, the, the comparison or? Well, ladders can be uh, looked at with these, uh, uh, these methods. And uh, we have not that, done that much of that, but... Uh, in, uh, I'm trying to remember now. Uh, there were some results that were obtained, I think, by Kivelson on uh, on the model where the uh, uh, that looked a little bit like what I was uh, showing here, where you have uh, uh, you're tiling uh, the lattice with the different uh, hoppings here. Uh, here, the hopping is the same everywhere, but you can imagine that you, you change the hopping in the cluster and outside. And I think in that case, uh, we have done some detailed comparisons, but I, I forget. So, uh, yes. Merci. Uh, you can uh, compare also with the uh, uh, quantum Monte Carlo methods that are available, but they are available usually at pretty high temperature. So that's in some sense, less interesting for superconductivity. Okay, more questions? So superconductivity, let's go back to the basics. Uh, so in the BCS theory, uh, a plane wave uh, electron scatters off uh, a phonon. And then later on, when the electron is gone, another one comes in Sorry, <laughs> I've been I read this backwards. So an ele another electron comes in and scatters off the same, basically the same wave because it moves very slowly. Okay, so what you have done here is form a Cooper pair. 
Now, in uh, the BCS theory, uh, there is also phase coherence. So let me, that's another aspect of superconductivity. So let me describe what phase coherence is. Here I will look at a very simple case where I try to minimize the potential energy. So the way to do that is to, in mean field, is to factor the incoming Cooper pair here that has P and minus P, and the outgoing Cooper pair that has P prime and minus P prime. Now you see that uh, if I want to minimize the energy and the effective potential here U turns out to be attractive, so negative, the way to do that is to have the same phase everywhere. So you see if the phase dependent on P and P prime, then it would sort of average out. But if it's the same independently of P and P prime, then it's, it, it's, it will lower the energy. And that gives you the BCS wave function. And the BCS wave function is just a coherent superposition of states with different uh, number of Cooper pairs. With the phase that is the same, every time you add and, or remove a pair, it, you add and remove it with the same, same phase. So it's the analog of the, of the laser, if you want. It is coherent, and the number of photons is not determined. <clears throat> so now I'm going to present cartoon pictures of what is the pairing mechanisms and then calculations. So let's start with the weak coupling uh, picture. So I just write the BCS uh, equation, uh, which corresponds to exchanging a phonon, like I mentioned uh, earlier. So I have the gap here, which is proportional to the order parameter, if you want. And in the case of phonons, I can assume that the gap is independent of, uh, of momentum. So uh, then uh, you see all this is positive. That's the excitation energy, and that's the Fermi function. And this here is positive. And I have a negative sign here, so I can simplify the equations and there will be the, the, the delta. And there will be a solution if U is negative, because then I have one on the left, which is positive. <coughs> Now, suppose that I exchange uh, antiferromagnetic spin waves. Then in that case, this U will be peaked somewhere else. It will be peaked at the antiferromagnetic wave vector, pi pi. So if I'm looking at the order parameter here in the direction P, <coughs> then uh, U is large for this wave vector, which means that I want to look at uh, delta of P prime and then so P prime has changed sign, then I'm okay. I will get rid of the minus sign and there will be a solution. So Claude Bourbonnet here in the audience is one of those who proposed this uh, mechanism a long time ago, even before the high temperature uh, superconductors. So uh, in this case, you get a D wave. And uh, just to keep answering the question of William uh, before is that uh, you can test uh, various broken symmetries in the methods I mentioned. You can test D wave, S wave, and so on. And, and you find that D wave is the sta stable one. So, so it is consistent from that point of view. So here are some calculations that were done at, uh, with a small uh, interaction strength. So this is half of the bandwidth for various uh, cluster sizes. And what is plotted here is one over the pair susceptibility. So the pair susceptibility becomes infinite at the transition temperature. So this should become zero at the transition temperature. And here is a blow up of the what's happening near zero temperature. And you see that uh, except for the very small cluster sizes, uh, there is a, it, it, it's converged as a function of, uh, of cluster size is concerned. So, so this is a solution of the one band Hubbard model that shows from the normal state, not assuming anything about the order parameter, except that you're looking at the D wave susceptibility and you see that it, it diverges. So it shows that this mechanism works at small interaction strength. Now let's look at the strong correlation limit. And uh, again, in uh, uh, first, I'm sorry, first to see uh, whether this is uh, relevant, uh, the strong correlation limit is, is, is relevant for us. So now I need to tell you what is a mutt insulator. 
let's talk first about the Northern Area Insulator. Uh, we better. Yes. Uh, yes, the D wave susceptibility uh, can be measured with some tuning experiments. So we're using Josephson uh, junctions. It is. Uh, it comes in as a as an extra. I mean, I, if I remember correctly, this was done by Scalapino. So you you uh, you you have a, you have two superconductors that have a different transition temperature, and so one that has a high temperature super, uh, high superconducting transition temperature is probing the one with the low superconducting transition temperature with the uh, Josephson uh, Josephson junctions. In other words. If I want to measure, um, uh, let's say, a total magnetic susceptibility, it's very easy. I apply a uniform magnetic field, and then I say, okay. Now, if I want to measure an unpaired magnetic susceptibility, I cannot apply an alternate magnetic field, but I can send neutrons that have the appropriate vector that will probe it. Now, what is the external probe <laughs> that creates Cooper pairs? Is uh, as you see, is, uh, I don't have a field for that. The field for that comes from another superconductor. That's a good question. Okay. In, in calculations, what you measure is really the pair pair correlation function in the normal state. Okay. Other questions? We uh, are just. Yeah, I guess for the, um, so you, you showed your cluster DMFT, and then you said, you know, this is uh, due to um, spin waves, basically. But how do you know that? I mean, you, you didn't impose spin waves or anything, right? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have time to show all these results, but I'm happy with that you asked the question. So you, you, can, you can look at the, uh, at the uh, pair susceptibility. So you look in the pairing channel, and then you you look at the uh, at the uh, irreducible vertex in that channel, and then you can look at the quantum numbers of that, and see that is largest when the momentum that is exchanged is pi pi, and when there's a spin is spin one. In other words, you want to have a spin flip. So I have actually I, I have a slide later that I could show if you're interested, but they, they have done this calculation. Yes, that's a good uh, question. So back to what uh, is a mat insulator. So this is a semiconductor. Uh, so it's insulating if you fill if you have n unit cells if you fill the the this uh, band here. So this is density of states as a function of energy. If you fill this band, then it's an insulator. A mat insulator is a strange beast because it occurs at a filling with a half filled band that should be metallic. Okay. But the interaction is so strong that it becomes an insulator. I told you earlier that this would happen. So if you look here, uh, there are, if there are n unit cells, there are n ways of removing n electrons and like an, in an occupied unit cell, and there are n ways to add another electron. Okay, so in total, there are two n states. This is the single particle density of states, if you want, but they have to be separated by the energy scale u, which leads to insulating behavior. Now, it's even stranger if you dope. So, what happens in an ordinary uh, semiconductor? If you dope, you just move the chemical potential. Okay, very easy. Here it's quite different. The whole density of state rearranges. Indeed, if you are, you start from this state that let's say that has one less uh, state or one state unit cell, one less, I'm sorry, unit cell occupied. Now you see that you have only n minus one ways of removing an electron in an occupied cell. And you have n minus one ways of adding an electron. So these are so called, these are the so called lower and upper Hubbard band. And you have two ways to add an electron here near the Fermi level. Okay, so we have rearranged the unit cell completely. Now, can we see a, an experimental proof of this? Let's start with the add filling case. So this is the result of sending a very high energy photon like 530 EV. So you're really 
taking a core electron and trying to put it uh, on the Fermi level. Uh, so uh, you see that as soon as you can put uh, this electron in the uh, upper Hubbard band, then you get a peak. That's this uh, peak here that you, you find. This is uh, zero doping. So this is half filling. Now, if you dope a little bit, for example, uh, as I showed uh, here, now you have this peak has gone down yeah, but because you have n minus one states. Okay. And you have a new peak that appears here that corresponds to the electron filling this uh, unoccupied uh, level. So in the cartoon, you can see it pretty quickly here. And you see that this goes down less rapidly than this one goes up, which is what the, the expected behavior. So that shows that the at F filling, the uh, group rates are mutt insulators. Now, uh, how do we get superconductivity in this strong correlation picture? I showed you earlier that there's this super exchange. Okay. So now if I write the spin operators in terms of fermions, it looks this way, where these are nearest neighbor. Let's put it in the simplest uh, case. And you can factor now C dagger with C dagger and C with C, just like I said uh, earlier with the potential energy. And if you define the D wave order parameter uh, uh, this way, that changes sign if you move from X to Y, then you find that the mean field Hamiltonian as an antiferromagnet, uh, which is this phase that we saw. And it's also attractive in this D wave uh, channel. So that's the cartoon again, picture of what happens in the one band Hubbard model. And these are very old ideas. Now, if you do a calculation in the case of the, of the one band Hubbard model, and you find uh, here is the temperature on the vertical scale, doping on the horizontal scale, and the various panels here are for different values on the interaction. And on the, uh, on the left here, you are it won't be insulator at that filling. And on the right here, it, it is all these states are insulator at that filling. And forget this first panel here. So uh, the, the, the color is just a superconducting order parameter, and the blue line is just a TC. Uh, now, it doesn't look quite like what is observed, and it's because the clusters here are not big enough to have phase fluctuations. I will show you results for bigger clusters in a moment. But the, it's sort of a mean field. This is the temperature. You have to think of this as a temperature at which copper pairs uh, form. And there are many experiments that suggest that indeed there are Cooper pairs above the transition temperature. Now, the last uh, bit to uh, notice about this is that the maximum here goes down as you expect if the pairing was due to 40 square over U. And I will come down, I will, I will move the connection with spin waves later in, in the detailed calculations. Uh, here is the effect of uh, phase fluctuations. You see, as the clusters grow, the, this one I think is uh, 12 sites, this one is uh, eight, and this one was two. And you see that as the cluster grows, the TC looks more and more like uh, the dome shape that we saw. Now, what is the origin of pairing? Uh, so we saw that for BCS, you gain potential energy. Here it turns out that uh, at large doping, you do gain potential energy. But at small doping, what you gain is kinetic energy. And that was seen in uh, uh, experiments using uh, some rules, in particular by uh, Nicole Bontin and also the group of uh, Van der Merel. So this comes out of the calculations. OK, now we go to the real, <laughs> the real thing. So we go to the three-band Hubbard model. So I will uh, describe what, uh, what this is. So the work was done with uh, David and his student uh, Siddhartha Dash, and with my two students, uh, Nicola and, uh, and uh, Patrick. But most of the results I will present, in, uh, except for the first one, uh, will come from David and, and Siddhartha. So back to the copper oxygen planes. The copper here is in red, and the orbital in that unit cell that's important is a, is a d orbital. 
And on the oxygen atom, what's important are the p orbitals. Now, electronic structure calculation gives us the value of all these uh, parameters. Uh, they are analog to what I've seen in the one band, what I've shown in the one band Hubbard model. But there's uh, extra players here that are epsilon p and epsilon d. All the, these are just the site occupation in the orbital occupation energy. I mean, take the orbital by itself and just look how much energy it takes to be there. It can be positive, it can be negative, but what's important is that there is a difference between epsilon p and epsilon d. Now, wh what about interactions? Interactions we put only on the copper. Yeah? There are interactions on the p orbitals, but they are much bigger orbitals and the uh, repulsion is much smaller. So we start with this uh, limiting case. Now forget about the interaction and just look at the bands for now. So this is the Brillouin zone and the Fermi surface is in this black line. And what is plotted on the right is the energy as a function of, of um, momentum along this isometry direction. So I move from the center of the zone to the corner, uh, back to the edge. So you see there are three bands. Why are there three bands? Because there are three orbitals per unit cell now. Okay, so there are, if you diagonalize this, there are three bands. Now the lower band is mostly copper. It comes mostly from copper. I mean, when you diagonalize, you mix copper and oxygen, but it turns out here it's mostly copper. And when you go to the Fermi level, which is right there along the, uh, that separates occupied from unoccupied states, you see that it's mostly uh, mostly oxygen, but uh, there are some colors here in the bit, in, in nice colors here that show that it's strongly hybridized uh, oxygen and copper. Now, uh, now that we have this three band model, if we think about interactions now, okay. <clears throat> Before I describe this uh, Mutt uh, Hubbard model, but now what we are dealing with is a charge transfer insulator. In other words, we still have this mud physics here, but we have an oxygen band in the middle. Okay, so what I showed before was just the band without interactions. But now if you put interactions, you see that the states that were on the copper here, some of the states are moved up here in the upper Hubbard band, and the oxygen is right in the middle. So there's a quantity here that's called the charge transfer gap, which will play a very important role in what's, uh, what, what will come. It's sort of replacing the interaction view. So as I said, this is mostly copper, this is mostly oxygen, and you see what the epsilon p and epsilon d mean here. Now, this is the cartoon here to the right, and I'm presenting the results of the calculation. So uh, for a model that I would call the ionic case, which has a manageable sign problem. In other words, I can do Monte Carlo with that problem, with that model. So you see the lower Hubbard band has a lot of copper uh, character. This is the blue, uh, the blue, the copper density of states is in blue here. And in the upper Hubbard band, you also see the, a lot of copper character. The oxygen density of states is in green, and you see it's in between the two bands. And near the Fermi level, so the Fermi level is at zero, the states are strongly mixed between copper and oxygen. These are so-called zhang rice singlets. That's in the, in the jargon of the field. And what I mean now by charge transfer gap is this gap right there. Okay. So are there any questions on, on this? <clears throat> Now D-wave superconductivity. Okay, this is the D-wave order parameter. And these are the three experiments that tell us how to optimize TC that I suggest we understand, okay? So one is on NMR, the other one is uh, scanning tunneling microscopy, and the other one, this one, there's another one here that I don't have time to mention, is on the neutron scattering. So let's take these experiments one after the other. But first, recall that there are different kinds of cuprates, all with different, uh, with the same, I'm sorry, copper oxygen plane, okay, that is illustrated here and at the bottom. So they all have the same copper oxygen plane, but they have different materials here in between. I hope we're not disconnected. Oh, yeah. 
I'm afraid we're disconnected. Everything is good. It's good. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. So, uh, so these uh, other atoms here are doping the conduction planes, but they also change the the, the hopping parameters. Okay, because uh, the, everything has to has to adjust. So here's a very uh, here is the result then of these experiments for different types of cuprates. Okay. And so you see that if we look at a given hole doping, uh, then the transition temperature or even just the optimal transition temperature is not correlated with uh, the doping. Why is that? Well, quantum mechanics tells us that if you put a hole in a unit cell, this hole has a probability of being on the copper, this is Nd, or of being on the oxygen, this is this two. NP. Okay, so no surprise there. Now, you, if I focus now on the optimal value of TC for each of these families, you see that uh, there's a clear correlation with the oxygen oil content. The larger the oxygen oil content, the larger the TC. I mean, we could do it on the copper axis also, but it's less dramatic than on the oxygen uh, axis. So here are the calculations. So this is for the ionic uh, model uh, that I, there's a, did we take this as a unit of energy? And the difference between epsilon p and epsilon d is large here. It's seven in the, the, these units. And that's why we call it the ionic model. Now, there, uh, what we do now, you, you start from these parameters and you change them one by one. Every time you change one parameter, you get a new material, okay? Material correspond to fixed, fixed uh, set of parameters. And then you have another degree of freedom, which is now the whole content of that uh, material in the copper oxygen plane. So if you plot now this time the TC obtained with the methods I described earlier in this three band model, and you look now, as a function of oxygen oil content along this axis, now the axis has shifted by 90 degrees for clarity, but you see that it's larger whole content clearly corresponds to higher TC. The correlation is not perfect, actually. There's an exception here, for example, but the trend is definitely uh, there. <coughs> now, as I said earlier, uh, if you look at the, the structure of these uh, compounds, uh, some of the layers there are there for doping. And if you look, some of them adjust the values of the parameters in the, in the plane. So here I call, uh, <laughs> now this is discouraging huh, for everyone. Now we won't need to look at this in detail. This is the result of electronic structure calculation. And the only thing to remember is that they give us, okay, the TC of the material that varies, you see widely. And it gives us the value of the different hopping parameters that I mentioned uh, earlier. And this will be our reference material that I will call our covalent model. And let's look at parameters. You see they vary here the, by a factor of what, uh, two or two and a half something. If you look at the various uh, columns. And uh, this one here, uh, PPP, there's not much it's 0.6 almost everywhere so that we take this as our unit of energy that's we took that equal to one uh, earlier so we have uh, tpp is one and epsilon p minus epsilon d now is 2.3 which is in these units which is typical of real cuprate superconductors not so at zero temperature like i'm doing now the same problem is irrelevant this is exact diagonalization and we can model that's realistic okay now with this realistic model now the density of states looks like the one i had before except the upper hybrid band is a smaller and now here i plot the d wave order parameter as a function of oxygen oil content and every one of these colors corresponds to a different set of parameters in other words to a different materials and what is clear is that the optimal 
the wave order parameter, and the D wave order parameter is plotted here on the vertical axis. The larger oxygen O content, uh, larger optimal parameter correspond to the larger oxygen O content. Okay, just as found it experimentally. But well, okay, you see here what's happening is you're, what you're saying is not true. And here what's happening is that the charge transfer gap is closing. So we're getting on the weak correlation side. Okay, so this coup rates don't have this. I mean, coup rates all have a charge transfer gap. So we were in this region. Okay, now a second experiment. Uh, uh, so uh, what, what do you want to do? What's true of this case? Well, uh, okay, what I'm drawing here is BISCO. This is BISCO, and then if you go back to the, uh, to the table, uh, what this is uh, is there. Uh, and so this core is here. So uh, why this U uh, you see as a larger uh, epsilon P minus uh, epsilon D. And if I go back to the to this, uh, sorry. Okay, I'll get it. Uh, be patient. Okay. There we are. Okay, so E epsilon P minus epsilon D is uh, uh, 2.3. And uh, here I have 2.5, which is a little bit. Uh, the, the, uh, I'm afraid the, the real BISCO would have. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't know actually. I, I need to check the, the numbers, I forget. Uh, we, uh, Cyril. Okay. Are these parameters of G? Okay, it's a very good question. I will answer to this at the end. Okay. <clears throat> Jeff. This is the size of the superconducting order parameter in the ground state. It doesn't tell us what TC is. It's, it's, it's actually quite pretty well correlated on the overdope side, but not on the underdope. And that's the reason I showed you the, the cluster calculations before, because the, the, in the domain where we can compute TC, it, the correlation still holds. Okay. Now I move to the second experiment to optimize TC and it's with the charge transfer gap. And I will show you in a minute that our oxygen is a witness. So this is, let's look at the experiments first. So this is a measure of the charge transfer gap with, um, uh, with uh, scanning tunneling microscopy. And this is the, the TC. And you see that the TC is largest when the charge transfer gap is smallest. And that's another experiment from the uh, Seamus Davis group, actually, that measures the, uh, the actual order parameter or something closely related to it as a function of the charge transfer gap. And again, there's an inverse correlation. And now you see that uh, the covalent model I was mentioning earlier is this set of uh, results here. So every point here, whoops, every point corresponds to the optimal, the value of the optimal order parameter for a given set of parameters. I mean, the color corresponds to what was in the previous slide. But the point is that the, uh, yes, so, so, so you see that the maximum order parameter, uh, again, here, this was a maximum TCD. So here we are looking at the maximum order parameter. And on the horizontal axis is the charge transfer gap. So, it's inversely pro uh, proportional to the charge transfer gap. So actually, this, these results are closer to those of the Seamus Davis group that uh, uh, measures not TC, but uh, the order parameter and the charge transfer gap. And you see that for the ionic model, uh, the maximum order parameter is, is uh, smaller than for the uh, covalent uh, model. Now it turns out that the uh, the charge transfer gap and the oxygen case 
are in fact exactly the same thing. In other words, if I plot the value of the oxygen oil content as a function of the charge transfer gap, for both models, they are perfectly correlated. These are, this is the closing of the charge transfer gap here. So this correlation can be understood very easily, actually. If I plot the oxygen density of states as a function of energy here, and I change the value of the interaction strength of U, you see what happens, I mean. The oxygen density of states is much smaller for a large transfer, charge transfer gap. Why is that? Because we know that the upper Hubbard band is mostly coupled, right? The interactions are on the couple. And um, everything here on the right of zero corresponds to holes. What's occupied is below the Fermi level. So the oxygen hole content is smaller for larger charge transfer gap. Okay, so there's an inverse correlation between the two, and that's what we saw. Okay, now let's look at the mechanism now, Cooper pairing. Focus on the right first. On the right, what I plot is the is J, the super exchange, as measured in the in the uh, in the calculation, <coughs> as a function of the charge transfer gap. And you see that they are for both the covalent models and the ionic model, they are inversely correlated. So if you remember this formula, so Jeff, we're getting close to your question. You see that uh, if we replace U here by the charge transfer gap, then things would fit. I mean, in the sense that J is inversely related to the charge transfer gap. Okay, so now what plays the role of the interaction is the charge transfer gap. Now, what, why is the error difference between the ionic and the covalent model? Well, clearly for the covalent model, the effective hopping will be larger than for the ionic model. It's more covalent, it's easier to, to hop. Now, if you plot instead the maximum superconducting order parameter as a function of J, okay, so the maximum order parameter as a function of J, now you see that both models give you this straight line, whether it's ionic or covalent model, J is perfectly correlated with the maximum superconducting order parameter. And that's what's found in these experiments with some exceptions that we can argue with this order. And that, that's something perhaps that needs to be explained. So back to Jeff's question about uh, the glue. So I will explain the glue in the one band Hubbard model where we have more results, but it's essentially the same in the, in the three band model. So uh, first let's look at the just BCS superconductor. What, why do we know that phonons are the pairing mechanism in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the BCS in BCS model? Sorry, I will take a bit of water. I put the imaginary part of the self energy for the Cooper pair. You can put this as some sort of scattering rate, not quite, but for the. And uh, you see that uh, there are two peaks. This is a thing from tunneling experiments. Now, if you look at the phonon density of states, it is this blue thing. And you shift it by the value of the gap. You see that there are two peaks that you see in both the cases. And in fact, there are elements of this. Uh, of these two peaks that appear a little bit later, that course that come from the fact that the BCS equation is nonlinear. So that was, you know, everybody was very happy with this. Now, what happens in the calculations? So, in the calculations, if you plot the same quantity, the imaginary part of the Cooper pair self energy as a function of frequency, you also see two peaks. This is for different dopings. Now plot the corresponding spectral weight to the imaginary part of the spin-spin correlation function <clears throat> as a function of energy for the same dopings. We see that it also has two peaks. I mean, these are the black uh, black dots. 
you know, if you take the black dots there and you take them, you put them down here with these magenta dots, then you see that again, if you shift, then it seems to be correlated. Now, experimentally, if you look at the maximum of this local spin uh, spectral weight as a function of TC, you see that they go down. In other words, the, the maximum guidable prime and the value of guidable prime at the, the lowest peak here, the one that is the smallest energy, goes down as TC goes down. And uh, uh, here the red curves are in the normal state. So basically here we are in the overdope region and also the, this peak goes, goes down, just like in the experiments. Okay, bonus now, we have some bonus results. Experimentally, the optimal TC does not does not occur always at the same whole doping. And indeed, if we plot the maximum uh, order parameter as a function of total whole doping, like is done experimentally, you lose the correlations. Okay. Earlier, I showed you that it's perfectly correlated with oxygen work content, but it's not correlated with total. Okay. And why is it not correlated with total whole doping? We know now. It's because what's important is the charge transfer gap, and it's the oxygen whole doping that measures this. Another bonus result that we get for free is the importance of covalency. If you look at the affinity energy of the first row transition metals and compare with the ionization energy of oxygen, it was in oxygen we form the strongest covalent bond. So again, that's consistent with I, what I was uh, saying earlier. So in summary, uh, how do we optimize TC? Well, spin one half, one band, two dimensions where covalency is more important, uh, is important. Strong covalency between the calcogen I mean the, the row uh, of the oxygen and the transition metal is important. You have to be in a case where the charge transfer gap is just opening, in other words, for intermediate interaction where it's hardest to do calculation. You need a large super exchange and there's more. I will sh show you, I mean, uh, for example, uh, I will show you a, uh, some a proposal here that's also based on some heuristic arguments that are added to this. And then there are more, uh, we have more tools today. Like for example, these two references, one of them is for, um, uh, I think uh, this, uh, forget which one now, but one of them is from Angu, actually at McGill, where you use uh, statistical learning methods or inter uh, artificial intelligence method and data mining, in addition to this heuristic concept to try to design higher temperature superconductors. So for example, this group here has proposed this, uh, to look at this, uh, at this compound. So I think that with these, uh, all these heuristics and uh, with, uh, again, the power of these uh, new uh, methodology that is coming into play, there is hope. I mean, I'm not saying it's trivial, but there is hope that you can design a room temperature superconductor. But we always need experimentalists for, for feedback, uh, the crystal growers. Okay. Well. Merci beaucoup, André Marie. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, uh, Patrick? So you left out the uh, electron dope uh, cuprase out of, the, of the, that picture. So um, what about that conclusion that you need uh, holes on the oxygen orbitals to get superconductivity? Does it apply to electron dope cuprase also? And in which, how do, would it pan out? How would it show up? Well, that's a very good question. That's exactly what we're looking at. Uh, now, and um, but also, I think there are several reasons I could get into that tell us that the electron dope cuprates are less strongly correlated, at least near optimal doping. And then, what you need is more like a closed uh, mechanism where you exchange uh, spin waves, so it becomes more of a long wavelength uh, problem. Where I think these methods are not most are not the most accurate, but anyway, we uh, with the uh, 
uh, with uh, Chloe and uh, uh, Jerome, and we're looking into uh, into the electron dope uh, cooperate with three bands. And try to already start answering some of these questions, and we have a few results for the. Uh, the, this set of methods for the, these uh, dynamical mean field also. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we have not looked at that uh, in enough detail uh, now. But I think that both sides of the phase diagram correspond to, you can go continuously from one to the other, except in the whole dope case, you're really doing at the more localized picture and the electron dope case is more extended. Euh, ma question, c'est donc euh, l'oxygène semble être un, aussi important que le cuivre. Donc, si je, veux re, si je prends le tableau périodique et je vais en bas, qui me donnera la même euh, chimie, disons, on, on pourrait peut-être remplacer l'oxygène par le soufre. Qu'est-ce que tu y penses? Oui, c'est exactement ça que je, que je suggère ici. C'est ce que je suggère ici, que si vous allez dans le... The column of uh, oxygen and you go down the transition metals and try to find a strong covalency and two dimensionality. Uh, that's a heuristic uh, thing that would be good for super looking for higher temperature superconductors. Yeah. Hopefully not too much to down. <laughs> if, you go, if you go down too much in the periodic table, it's going to be a very expensive superconductor. Yeah, so it, at the same time, so, so but do we need spin one half or would three half work too or can it be spin one even if you have just one band uh, that is at the fermi level it will be spin one half if you have a larger spin uh, content it means that uh, you have one joule coming in and you have many more uh, fermi surfaces at the uh, yeah for, many more for me yes sir many more states at the fermi level and uh, so, for example, uh, for the iron, uh, the, uh, the nictides, yes, spin fluctuation methods tend to work uh, rather well, actually. Um, and uh, the reason is that the, the uh, interactions are, I mean, when there are more orbitals, uh, the electrons can hide <laughs> at many places, and the effect of interactions is not so strong. You can treat it with the spin <coughs> fluctuation methods and ab initial methods, and and you, you can get some successful results. I mean, Arizona uh, Rafkan was, that was here before has done calculation for some of these, for example, lithium iron arsenide, and I found some interesting results, yes. So it, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's not easy. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, nice talk, André Marie. Uh, as an experimentalist, uh, I would like to ask you two questions. So, if you want to try to be more quantitative, do you understand why Tc is maximum in the three layer mercury based uh, cuprate? Of course, I know that G is higher here, but G is of the, is of the same order of magnitude in LSCO than in this compound. And the second related question is, um, are we in the limit of TC with cuprate? So shall we, as you suggest, change the, the formula? So in another way, so uh, did we reach the maximum of TC with, uh, with cuprate uh, yet? Uh, OK, so the first question is about the value of uh, of JS LSCO is definitely an outlier in this uh, in this game. I mean, it has a large J and the TC is not so large, but it turns out it's quite uh, disordered. I mean, the, the the doping levels are right next to the copper oxygen. That's one problem, and um, uh, uh, then the for the second question uh, regarding uh, whether we have uh, reached the maximum TC for coup rates. Um, I mean, uh, you can fiddle with parameters a little bit. And indeed, you know that if you apply pressure on the, uh, actually, if you apply pressure, you decrease TC, if I remember correctly, in the case of the, so you, you would need to strain the, <laughs> 
in mercury it increases okay so and then you actually see how it's correlated with all these uh, parameters so uh, i mean answering one of your previous questions uh, you know what defect what defines this effective uh, hopping is uh, you can do uh, strong coupling degenerate perturbation theory and uh, try to see how to relate uh, this effective hopping to all the microscopic parameters the formula that you get is a mess so here I sort of add a sort of where I just looked at the uh, at the charge transfer gap and uh, epsilon p minus epsilon d was huge so difference between the the covalent models and the ionic model so I was sure that it is related to this effective uh, this effective hopping so the answer is I don't know the frank answer is I don't know and uh, but uh, I think there's one should look at a different uh, set of compounds. Yeah. Um, unless there's another question, Philippe. Okay, just. Uh, yeah. So, so my question is more down to earth. So in this in this uh, search of a high TC uh, or even room temperature superconductor. Uh, we usually explore uh, exotic materials with uh, like complex uh, compounds. My question is, would there be an issue in eventually if we want to implement these uh, these uh, these perspective that you were showing in the, in, in the beginning of your presentation of uh, transport of energy and, and things like that and require a huge amount of material? Will there be an issue at some point of scalability for these for these compounds to be built? Yes, in engineering questions are in general are very far from trivial. So um, you don't want to, Bertrand, to ask a question? No. Okay. So uh, yes. So yeah, that could definitely be a, a problem. I mean, uh, it's not because it's superconducting at room temperature that it's useful. It could be that it's very brittle, and then you cannot make cables, and it, a lot of things. I mean, that can uh, that can uh, happen uh, on the way. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. I was just wondering if there, if there is perspective with these uh, compounds to 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 grow them on a much larger scale, or well, well, there are already uh, superconducting cables that go uh, across uh, rivers, for example, in the United States uh, to carry uh, electricity, and in uh, Korea also where they have replaced a lot of uh, uh, hanging wire, copper wires that were in the street or uh, up uh, in the air by a single uh, superconducting uh, cable. I think they are made of BISCO, I'm not sure. But uh, there's a company that's called American Superconductors that make uh, these high temperature superconductors in large quantities. And they're already used for transporting electricity without uh, resistance uh, over long distances. So, so these uh, applications are there, they exist. OK, thank you. So in, there's even there was even a project I don't know if it's still on there but there was a project between uh, Tunisia and Japan where this uh, they they were building a solar uh, a solar farm if you want the solar panels in Tunisia where there's a lot of sun and the plan was to have a superconducting cable go under the Mediterranean to bring the power in Europe. And uh, I know this started in 2010, and I don't know where it is now. Perhaps it stopped. I mean, clearly the investments are <laughs> are huge there. So, well, you can uh, you 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 send uh, uh, you send the liquid nitrogen basically uh, parallel uh, a parallel circuit uh, across. Uh, it's completely crazy. I mean. Uh, but uh, I mean, we, I mean, they put this, they put uh, the, the wires across the ocean in the 19th century, right? And that also looked crazy, but it, it worked. Another question, Cyril or Albert Bertin? Uh, let me go to Bertin. What about entanglement? Yes. Well, I can give another talk on entanglement, actually. So thank you for that. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, actually, they are on this slide, so I could go right, right on. But I think you're all tired, and I'm not sure this is a very comfortable room. So, uh, uh, but uh, 
Yeah, I am not. I'm not sure. It's very that it, it has a lot to to say. But uh, yeah, if you look at mutual information, for example, it's largest where the uh, superconducting uh, where the TC is largest. So there's a correlation between mutual information, at least compared with what it would be in the normal state. Yes. William, another question. Uh, oui, André Marie. Um, uh, it's uh, down to uh, down to earth question or down to the cluster question. So, uh, can you tell me about uh, the frontier for the convergence of CDMFT in terms of what regimes of temperature and U uh, are we uh, reaching the bottleneck? Right, because you're solving with ED. These uh, yeah, the mostly these results I showed were with the ED, yeah, and the TC I showed were were with uh, the the cyberization expansion. And uh, so eventually, you know, one hits a wall in terms of cluster size. And yes. where where are we now? What's the the horror, the, the frontier? So, well, you said that with the. Uh, with uh, the U equals 40, the first results I showed that are pretty old, actually, they, they were able to reach relatively large cluster size, I don't know, 20 sites or 24, I forget the exact number. Uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, uh, people do uh, 12 sites, for example, uh, that is pretty much a, a state of the art. And with CDMFT, uh, you already with just four sites, uh, you have a same problem if you try to work with the covalent model. So, uh, the, 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 in the, for this three band model. So, uh, we are pretty much with the, to the limit where what we can, uh, uh, what we can achieve with, uh, uh, with this, unless someone comes up with a, a bright idea, actually. Uh, I don't, we, <laughs> We are working on the variational approaches that could help us to go to larger cluster sizes, but then you will criticize because if it's a variational approach, so, so there are variational parameters. Uh, but uh, the point is that uh, the more methods you can use and get to the same result, uh, the more convinced you you become. I mean, that's the whole problem with this uh, this field is that the traditional methods uh, did, didn't quite work so you have to go to other methods now variational wave functions have already given d wave superconductivity a long time ago except that the computers were not at the states they are now so we can we do we can do better and you have to realize that from the point of view of dynamical fluctuations uh, this is the, the at least in the continuous time quantum monte carlo the system is infinite i mean we uh, and there's a, the, the, the image rate time is, is on a continuous scale, which is equivalent to having a path uh, that is uh, infinite. So uh, it looks ridiculous to see you're working on four sites or 20 sites or 16 sites, but in reality, the bat is infinite. At least in continuous time quantum Monte Carlo, which you can match to the exact diagonalization. And as I said, the exact diagonalization is going to better at, the, at zero temperature, where the correlation length is small. And how about, uh, you know, quantum simulators, you know, uh, using cold atoms and other still too uh, well, cold warm? Atoms are, cold atoms, ultra cold atoms are still very hot, as you know. And yeah, the fermionic one. Uh, yeah. So, but do you uh, think that's, uh, that's the next frontier? Because eventually, uh, you know, one needs either quantum simulation or a different algorithm, right? Because it's uh, the scalability is just exponential. Yes, with quantum uh, computers, uh, the people are already uh, thinking of uh, variational machines uh, that, with, that can do calculations with relatively few qubits uh, that will be available soon. I know that's one, uh, one approach. I mean, you can use a quantum computer as an impurity solver at least for single site dynamical mean field theory, it's certainly generalizable to more. Um, yeah, that, uh, yeah, new machines uh, will help, I hope, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you for your patience. <laughs> Merci beaucoup for... Uh,